You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. For about two years now, I've been hearing a lot of buzz about the immersive exhibits with projected images of paintings filling the room and allowing people to step into the world created by Vincent van Gogh, Claude Monet, perhaps other artists too. A few years prior to the immersive experiences, though, filmmakers brought Van Gogh's paintings to life in a completely new and different way. In 2017, Loving Vincent became the first painted movie. I feel like who art Ed? Try to spice it. Who art Ed? Mr. Wood, art Ed, me. Either way, it's ambiguous. It works on so many levels. I know. That's off to a great start. Welcome to Who Arted, where we explore visual arts in an audio medium. I'm your host, Kyle Wood. For this week's Fun Fact Friday, I'm going to be talking about a little-known art house movie, an animation of sorts, made in a way unlike any other I've ever seen before. Loving Vincent was an experimental film. It was a drama based on the life and death of Vincent van Gogh. Now, the story of Vincent van Gogh's death in and of itself sounds like fertile ground for a movie. Most people know that Vincent van Gogh suffered from mental illness throughout his life. Sadly, this is an all-too-common and relatable experience, and sadder still, many people struggling with these illnesses do not get the help that they need. But his death was odd. While it's commonly believed that he died by suicide, there are elements that many people find unsettling, such as the missing gun. Few people who shoot themselves take the time to hide the gun afterwards. There are many who believe that Vincent was, in fact, murdered, or perhaps shot accidentally by a couple of local boys who were known to brandish a gun and who had previously hassled and tormented the artist. Vincent lived for a while after being shot. He made it home, and in his bed, he's quoted as having said, Do not accuse anyone. He talked of his pain, and he talked about wanting to end his life, but he never said he did take steps to do so. Many point to his last words as a suggestion that he was miserable, but ever the kind soul, he wanted to let his killers off the hook. So in 1890, Vincent dies, and then just a little later, in 1891, Theo, Vincent's brother, his art dealer, and financial supporter also died. Theo's widow Jo was left without her husband and his steady income, but she did have a ton of Vincent's paintings. She's the one who actually crafted the image of the artist and built his legacy. Today, Vincent van Gogh is sort of the model we hold in our minds of the tortured artist. He saw little to no commercial success in his lifetime. He struggled with addiction and mental health. He lived on the fringes of society, inspired by other artists, and impoverishing himself in his drive to create. He was known to go without food at times because he was spending all his money on paint. And now we can see his dramatic tale unfold through paint. A team of 125 artists from around the world produced 65,000 paintings to animate the film. Film and animation basically work off the principle that if you have a bunch of pictures played back really quickly, it overwhelms the eye. The human eye can't process more than 10 pictures or frames in a second. So it stops looking like a series of pictures and instead looks like one picture that is just constantly moving. For Loving Vincent, the artists created an oil painting on canvas for each of the 65,000 frames. They recreated some of his masterpieces, telling the dramatic tale through his best-known works, in his style and in his preferred medium of oils. So how'd they do all this? Well, the storyboard for the movie included a number of Vincent van Gogh's paintings. 
Sometimes they had to sort of expand the scene or they sort of cropped parts of it. Sometimes they would adjust the season or the time of day in some of the paintings in order to get a little bit of continuity. And like I said, they had to crop things or adjust it and expand the frame because they needed to make it work for the aspect ratio of a film, which is always in landscape style. And a number of his canvases were portrait style. So after they came up with that storyboard and which of his paintings they were going to base the different scenes on and all of that sort of stuff, they hired actors who looked kind of like the people Vincent van Gogh painted. And they recruited a team of 125 well-trained oil painters rather than traditional animators. They really wanted to emphasize the painting technique in this. A bit of the movie was made by rotoscoping, which is a technique of basically drawing on top of a frame of film. The actors were filmed in front of a green screen, then editors made a composite shot, replacing the green screen to put Vincent van Gogh's paintings into the background. Now here's the tricky part. After the green screen and all that editing... They put every single frame of the film onto canvas. It took six years to make it. They painted 65,000 frames on canvas. Today, only about a 1,000 of the paintings remain because after a frame was painted and photographed for the film, they'd typically reuse the canvas. Oil paints take a long time to dry, so they'd be able to make slight alterations to a wet painting for the next frame. It was a remarkable feat, blending old and new media. Now, as I said last week, I'd really like to make this show more of a two-way conversation, because art is for everyone, and I want everyone to be able to share their thoughts and connections. I had a listener reach out and shared an interesting little bit about Vincent van Gogh. I actually was so excited someone reached out to me. I made this mini episode because of it. The episode I had planned for this week was going to be about Fregonard's painting, The Swing. But I guess that can wait for another day. This week's fan fact came from Ken in South Carolina. He emailed saying, My fun fact is that, as crazy as it may sound, Vincent van Gogh painted his self-portrait with a bandage over his ear to prove his sanity. He wanted to show that he was taking care of himself and following the doctor's orders. Thanks, Ken, for not only that interesting fun fact, but also the delightful phrasing about sound and crazy related to his ear and demonstration of sanity. I see what you did there, and I'm here for it. If you have a fun or interesting bit of information you'd like to share, email me, whoartedpodcast at gmail.com, or hit me up on social media at whoartedpodcast. You can send me a written message for me to read on the show, or send me an audio file so everyone can hear from you directly. But regardless of the format, I would love to hear your fun facts and connections to whatever art and artists you want to share. This concludes this week's episode of Who Arted, part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. If you found this tolerable, please leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. You can find images of the work being discussed this week and every week on social media at Who Arted Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And of course, on the website, whoartedpodcast.com. Podcast done.